Good morning. The future of food. Before we can look to the future, we have to look at the past and the present. Let's all think back about 20 or 30 years of an exper dining experience we had. For most, of my, for most of us, that entailed the family uniting around the dinner table. Sometimes that food can even be smelt about an hour prior to sitting down at that dinner table. As you can see from this image, the meal usually included a center of the plate item. That item was usually a protein, which is supported by maybe two or three side dishes. What you don't see in this image are iPhones and iPads. So let's shoot to the future, or excuse me, to the present, today. And I would like to invite all of you into my dining room. As you can see, things get a little chaotic around our house around dinner time. My wonderful wife, Erin, does a phenomenal job of rallying these troops up to get them ready for dinner. We have Wyatt, who's seven, Austin and Georgia, who are three, and we got little Hudson, who's two. As you can see in this image, we have one center of the, center of the plate item, and that's pasta, because it's an easy, quick fix for a meal solution for our family. What you don't see in this image is that an hour prior to sitting down at this dinner table, these kids were snacking on things. So let's shoot to the future. There are people who make things happen. There are people who watch things happen. And there are people who wonder what happened. To be successful, we have to be people who make things happen. Our team is here today to talk to you about three new and emerging categories within the food industry. And we ask that at the end of this presentation, you choose at least one, at least one of these categories and how you can implement them into your everyday business. So we're going to look at this in regards to the three areas that we're going to focus on. One is sustainable protein. The global population is growing at an alarming rate, but at the same time, the resources remain limited. We're going to need to find other additional sources of protein in order to keep up with the future supply and demand. Secondly is the emerging trends in the uh, consumers, consumers' behavioral patterns. People are living a lifestyle that is much more fast these days. And with the emergence of future technology in meal replacements, we're going to be able to supply these people with a fast, quick, and healthy meal solution throughout the day. And secondly, we are seeing the emergence of a new generation, the millennials. With these millennials come new views and perception on the world. These new views and perceptions are going to change considerably in how the government handles its laws and regulations. So our team is here to focus on three key areas today. The first, being sustainable protein. The two, second, being uh, meal replacements. And the third, being retail marijuana. My name is Vince Clorty, and I am with Farmer John Foods. And it is my honor today to introduce my immediate FIM family. We have Nick Novak with Metropolitan Markets. We have Karen Koritowski with Smart and Final. We have Liz Kasula with Nestle. And we have Mike Johnson with Fred Meyer. Now Mike's going to kick things off today by talking about sustainable protein. Sustainability. So sustainable is one of those new and growing trends that is coming right now. So for companies out there that have made things happen over the last decade, they've shown tremendous growth out of two emerging categories, <coughs> organic and natural. Now sustainability is going to be one of those categories that takes us for the next 10 years, or forward to the next 10 years. Now, it's going to be more than just a label, but it's actually going to be a category or a section. Now, Chipotle, as an example, is a company that has built a brand around sustainability. So now we need to make a case for sustainability. So why is sustainability an issue? Currently, the population is growing, and we have approximately 7 billion people on this planet right now. In 10 short years, we'll have just over 8 billion people. Now, that's only 1 billion. However, that equals or that equates to one city of Los Angeles being dropped on our planet every 20 days for the next 10 years. That's a lot of people. And for those of you who drove here, you, you realize that. <laughs> so in addition to this, we have approximately 2 billion people that are overweight or possibly obese, and approximately 1 billion people on this planet by the year 2025 that are going to be malnourished. We have a distribution of food issue going on right now. New companies are being innovative in trying to create new sustainable foods, and specifically sustainable protein. Protein, obviously, is a hot trend right now. Companies are looking for ways to generate protein from, 
from vegetables, nuts, um, algae, and what I'm here to talk to you about today, bugs. Specifically, the cricket. Now, our team has adopted uh, the gateway bug as the great name for this cricket. Now, the cricket really satisfies a couple different issues. It's highly sustainable, and it's a high-quality source of protein. So it addresses both of these key components. Now, why? <clears throat> so as far as sustainability goes, the gateway bug, there's, currently we feed two-thirds of our food to our food. That's a lot of food. Beef, as an example, it takes 2,000 gallons of water and 10 pounds of food to make one pound of beef protein. Crickets, on the other hand, for one pound of cricket protein, it takes just one gallon of water and just under two pounds of food to make that one, one pound of cricket protein. In addition, there's new innovation around using, actually using corn byproducts to actually feed the crickets. So another step in the sustainability. Now consumers, you may already know this, and a lot of the buyers know this already, but consumer demand for clean labeling is extremely important. People want to know what's going in the products, and they want to be able to see it on the ingredients labels. Cricket protein is one of those ingredients that will satisfy that need. <clears throat> cricket protein is high, it's a high quality source of protein that, that consumers will be looking for. Now, as far as the, the consumer labels, the, um, the labeling, there's a lot of pressure right now on clean labeling in the forms of the diet trends that are going on right now. Echo diet, paleo diet, uh, gluten-free. So it's already out there. Consumers are looking for it now. There's 30 new companies that have just emerged over the last year that are using cricket powder in their products. Companies like Biddy Foods, Exo Bars, Chirps, are all new innovative companies that are just emerging. And they're showing year over year double growth since 2010. Now, Biddy Foods is an interesting company. So Biddy Foods actually makes baked goods. They make a baking powder or a baking flour to cook their, to cook their breads. They have cool items. I mean, cinnamon loaf bread, uh, spice scones, and our absolute favorite was the chocolate chip cookies. Now, there was a serious branding issue with the chocolate chip cookies. We really felt that they should have been called chocolate chirp cookies. <laughs> now, in addition to this, there's also new companies out there that are being innovative, and they're making a statement to consumers that they're innovative and that they're interested in sustainable products. One of these companies is JetBlue. JetBlue is offering exobars, the cricket flour protein bar, on their flights from New York to LA. Now, they haven't quite determined how much they're going to charge passengers for these bars, or more specifically, how much they're going to have to pay the passengers to eat them. <laughs> but at least they're making a statement about being sustainable and offering a sustainable ingredient or sustainable food source. So before I turn it over to Liz, who has something exciting to share, I want to leave with you one last thing. I know what you're thinking about bugs. I know because I'm thinking it too. The, in the 60s, in the late 60s, right here in California, actually in LA, sushi was introduced. And I'm guessing the way you're feeling about eating cricket flour products is similar to how people felt about eating sushi in the late 60s. Now, today, sushi is a $2 billion industry. So I'll be talking about meal replacements, which was a really fun category to talk about because it's growing so quickly. And it's not just growing, it's actually just emerging. So let's take a look at the history of meal replacements. So about 50 years ago, there weren't really many on the market. It was Carnation Instant Breakfast, Baby Formula, and MREs in the military. It was really the only meal replacement products that existed. And today, it's a lot more interesting, but it's still just a collection of snacks and supplements. Nothing on the market today was meant to replace a full meal. Which brings us to a new brand that's been making a lot of news, Soylent. So for those of you who remember the movie from the 70s, Soylent is named after Soylent Green, the sci-fi flick from the 70s, which is a, a bit weird for those of you who know the movie. But Soylent is meant to be a 100% food replacement. Now, Soylent has a lot of issues, right? It has the really bad brand name, it has no distribution, it has no advertising. There's only one flavor that people compare to pancake batter. So you wouldn't think this would be real popular, but there's actually a four-month wait list if you want to order Soylent. So this was confusing to us, right? What could be driving all this demand for Soylent? But when you stop and look at it, it's actually this really widely appealing list. Soylent offers 100% nutrition, it's faster than food, cheaper than food, and it's a highly sustainable product. So there's a lot of people that are interested in taking a lot of time and effort out of the way they interact with food. 
And Soylent doesn't really want to replace all your meals. It just wants to replace the meals that you don't really care about. So I have to tell a personal story because uh, something came full circle for me when I was working on this. I started working in the food industry 11 years ago for Nestle Purina. And uh, at the time, my parents had always had dogs and we always fed them Purina dog chow. So my dad was really excited about my new job and he had this idea he wanted me to pitch to Purina. He wanted Purina to make people chow, a meal replacement for people. And he was super excited about it. He was like, Liz, what if we could get rid of all the food drama and just have a cup in the morning and a cup at night, just like the dogs do? This is a great idea, you gotta pitch it. So there was no way I was approaching Purina about this idea, right? Uh, but he kept asking me about it for months afterwards. Uh, and so 11 years later, I'm in the FIM program, we're researching Soylent, and Soylent actually has an open source recipe online. So anybody who wants to make it can go make it because they're so behind on production. And so I'm looking through the recipes and their number one rated recipe on Soylent.com is called People Chow. <laughs> so dad was right, and this is really a thing people want. Um, so I still stand by, they would have thought it was crazy 11 years ago though. Um, but back to business. So what, what does Soylent look like if the food industry gets involved, right? So the, the history of Soylent was this was a product that was designed by uh, somebody up in Silicon Valley who was looking to um, you know, cut costs in his life and work on his uh, startup business. But if the food industry got involved, think about all the awesome stuff we could bring to meal replacements. It could have energy benefits. It could have beauty benefits. You could use a product like this to help people manage disease like diabetes, digestive issues, heart health. There's amazing things that can happen with food and meal replacements. So we want to show you a video that talks about just how strong the link is between food and nutrition and how scientists are already treating cancer with food. Here is a growing list of our anti-androgenic foods and beverages that we're interested in studying. And for each food type, we believe that there's different potencies within different strains and varietals. And we want to measure this because, well, while you're eating a strawberry or drinking tea, why not select the one that's most potent for preventing cancer? So here are four different teas that we've tested. They're all common ones. Chinese jasmine, Japanese sencha, Earl Grey, and a special blend that we prepared. And you can see clearly that the teas vary in their potency from less potent to more potent. But what's very cool is when we actually combine the two less potent teas together, the combination, the blend, is more potent than either one alone. This means there's food synergy. Here's some more data from our testing. Now in the lab, we can simulate tumor angiogenesis represented here in a black bar. And using this system, we can test the potency of cancer drugs. So the shorter the bar, less angiogenesis, that's good. And here are some common drugs that have been associated with reducing the risk of cancer in people. Statins, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and a few others, they inhibit angiogenesis too. And here are the dietary factors going head to head against these drugs. You can see they clearly hold their own, and in some cases they're more potent than the actual drugs. Soy, parsley, garlic, grapes, berries. I could go home and cook a tasty meal using these ingredients. Yeah, so imagine, right? Imagine if the food industry could harness something like this and market it and supply it to customers in a way that would really impact their lives and their health. I think it's really powerful, and I think that meal replacements is where this is going to happen. Now, I know we've been a little bit provocative so far with our cricket protein and our food replacement, but we've been saving the biggest change for last. Karen? So the topic that I'm going to talk about doesn't have a past, well, at least not a legal one. <laughs> Here's a question we need to ask ourselves. When a $40 billion opportunity emerges, how will we respond? 40 billion, that's a big number, so let me put it into perspective for you. Yogurt is a $7 billion category. Cereal is a $10 billion category. The two of those together won't be half of what retail marijuana is projected to be. Wine, a category that almost all of you deal with in some way, is a $36 billion category. That's not just wine sold in grocery stores, that's wine sold everywhere. 
When you think about how much yogurt, cereal, and wine we sell, retail marijuana looks like a pretty attractive revenue stream, too big to ignore. Now, talking about selling marijuana in a grocery store can be an uncomfortable conversation. So it's exciting to see some first movers from both the retail and CPG front. Whole Foods co-CEO John Mackey has publicly stated that they would be willing to sell marijuana where it was legal and that they had community support. Skinny Girl continues to innovate and has talked about a specially engineered strain that doesn't give people the munchies. <laughs> And our socially progressive friends at Ben and Jerry's have said, why not let people combine their pleasures and have talked about a cannabis-infused ice cream, again, where it's legal. There are many ways that we can engage in this category. This adoption scale shows what, the, what, the, what it will look like. The question is, how far along the scale do our businesses want to go? The further along you move, the more revenue that you generate. Currently, there are five states that have legalized recreational marijuana. In 2016, five more states are projected to legalize recreational marijuana. Note that three of those states are California, Nevada, and Arizona. In 2017, five more states are projected to legalize recreational marijuana. If, if we do business in any of the states that just turned green, we have to have a strategy in place for how we're going to deal with this in the next three years. By 2025, it's projected to be nationally accepted, nationally <laughs> accepted, and we will see the $40 billion in revenues. Now that we have this information, what are we going to do? Now Nick's going to give us a recap and talk to you about our recommendations. We've given you some food for thought today. Sustainable proteins, health and meal replacements, and retail marijuana. We started today by talking about sustainable proteins. Let's take a look at a product that we all carry in our stores today, grass-fed beef. Just a few years ago, this was considered a specialty product. But today, each of us carry this product, because without it, you would be chasing away a customer to one of your competitors. So what kind of message do you want to send to your customer? the customer of the future, the millennials. We've heard a lot today about social media and the impact that it can have on your business. How impactful will a positive tweet, Facebook post, or Instagram picture be about your company? It's the decisions that you make today that will determine the way the consumers talk about your companies in the future. We continue today by talking about meal replacements and health. Now, I think we all know each of us are sick and tired of being sick and tired. But do we think that our steak and chicken meals are going away? I sure hope not, and neither does my team. But we do think that there is an opportunity to replace breakfast or possibly lunch. In fact, a recent survey shows that over 30% of millennials replace one meal every single day with something other than food, such as a bar or a beverage. This trend is emerging, and as these younger generations become the more predominant shoppers, it will continue to increase. Now we finish today by talking about retail marijuana. This is possibly the most controversial product that our industry has ever or will ever have to deal with. 
Will you choose to be an innovator, an early adopter? If so, what will you do to ensure the impact on your community and your customers is not a negative one? Or will you choose to avoid this potential PR nightmare? But if you do choose to avoid it, what will your alternative strategy be when the competitor down the street does choose to carry retail marijuana? This decision is coming a lot sooner than most of us realize. And that's why we ask you today to start thinking about where you will fall on this scale. And we've given you some things to think about today, and we have three recommendations. We hope you select at least one of them as you move forward into planning for the future of the food industry. Allow for your categories teams to focus on innovation and emerging trends. Create an in-store destination for meal replacements and supplements. And know what your level of engagement will be when retail marijuana is available. We hope you are as excited as we are about the future of food and the possibilities for our industry. Thank you for your time this morning. We will now open up the floor for questions. Oh, come on. Marijuana? Here, <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't antagonize. <laughs> Which retailer do you think is going to be the most aggressive at getting out there with the marijuana? I think it's Whole Foods, for sure. Mm -hmm. they, they're already on the record, and I would think that there's some, probably some other small retailers that are into it, too. I mean, it, the margins are fantastic, and I just think that there's a lot of acceptance out there for it. We didn't show the graph that talked about how much of the U.S. is in support of legalization, but I think it's above 56% now. Yes, sir. At what, point, at what point does the federal government legalize it? You know, right now they're working on um, making it not be a Schedule I drug, and so I think that's going to happen. President Obama's already talked about that, and so I think that will happen in the near future. Right now, the big thing about it not, of the federal government not being involved is the banking and how they handle all the money. So that's the big thing for right, them right now. Some small credit unions are getting involved to help with that, but I think it's... Um, sooner rather than later. So it has to be a cash business now, right? Yes, it is. It's a cash business right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. How, how do you expect um, companies to deal with the marijuana when they don't allow their employees to, to use that product or they won't hire people that have used it? <laughs> so actually, okay. So actually, um, they had a, a special that they showed in Colorado where they had someone who they, he was actually taking it for medical purposes, and he lost his job. So there are companies they talk about, even the um, group that was running the marijuana um, store in uh, Colorado said, they asked their people, you know, have you been smoking marijuana today? So that's one of those things that they'll kind of have to look at. If that's a policy in your company, then you don't want people doing that while they're working. If they do that outside, that's, that's gonna be something that companies are gonna to have to look at and see what they wanna do about that. That's a, that's a great question. Right. Right. And, and there's a lot of different levels of marijuana that you can have. Some have more THC that are more the, um, you know, give you more of the high and some that are less. So um, it might even be, you know, that kind of your blood alcohol is a certain amount, your THC might be a certain amount as well. But that is something that, again, how do we start preparing for that? Because it's going to come be happening. Um, I know you said you tested the uh, cricket flower. What kind of <laughs> testing did you do on the marijuana? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, Karen, you said you, uh, what, what do you think? What do you think the acceptance would be, seriously, and in, in, say in 2016, if it's legalized in California, in the current shopper 
uh, mindset in California. What do you think? Do you think there'd be more detractors than acceptors? It, it would. It would cost. It would cost you to lose more customers than the customers you would gain through the sales of marijuana. Or, what's your thoughts on early adopters in 2016? This is something that. Uh, John Mackey actually addressed in his uh, press release about marijuana is that it will be a very thoughtful process. You're going to have to talk to your customers, possibly take a poll, and really talk to the community and see what they feel is the best way to introduce marijuana into the stores. It will likely be locked up, similar to your spirits, possibly be in the pharmacy area, um, but it will be a very thoughtful process. Uh, um Nice job, by the way. This is, you know, but now we know why you were late coming out. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess the, 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 the one question I do have is um, the, 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 the bigger picture. Um, and, and by the way, this Soylent, my son actually purchased that. It did take him four months. Wow. He does use it, and he says it's... Uh, now that he's used it, he probably won't use it again. It's, it, I mean, it's not that it's a bad thing, it's just mm -hmm. not really right for his lifestyle. So there's the attitudes that then translate to behaviors mm -hmm. that then they either accept or don't accept. And I see the same thing similar for this too, and especially in the marijuana category. The bigger picture is how big is the prize? Because this thing is already starting off. Yeah, it's going to be legal. It's going to be like cigarettes. Whether I like it or not, it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, but as you see in Colorado, everybody and their mother is selling it. They're paying taxes on it. Now they're paying too many taxes on it and everything else. By the time the retailers try to get involved in it, it's already going to be so saturated. Why at retail? I mean, what's the size of the price for the retailer? It's yeah. not going to be the $40 because it's already going to be eaten up by all the small shops and everything else. Yeah, correct. So you would have to, the retailers would probably have to be licensed as dispensaries. So just like you run a dry cleaning operation out of your store now, you'd also be get a license for the dispensary. Um, I think actually there's, there's a lot of headroom. I mean, can you think of how complicated it must be to run a business with 80 different suppliers? But what if a big company like Philip Morris decided, hey, we're going to enter here, we're going to really make this um, you know, a professional business. We're going to bring some science, you know, some science and accuracy to marijuana. We'll have, you know, one big supplier that can, can deal with big retailers. And I think there's more fear now in the industry from the small guys waiting for that big guy to get in. Because right now it's mom and pop shops. And as soon as a big company decides to enter, that will really disrupt their business. But, you know, I, we think it'll uh, be consolidated. So then, therefore, do you, when government does intervene, and they will, you know, from the onset even, um, is there going to be regulation or, you know, a price floor, price ceiling, or whatever it might be that's going to impact even the profitability on either side? Because suddenly you can't just say, because I'm a big retailer, I can buy cheaper, I'm going to sell it for nothing. There's government intervention, like there is tobacco and everything else. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, we, we think it'll be regulated similar to tobacco or um, alcohol, where there'll be floors and ceilings and try and, and, and not cross promote it, you know, be responsible in selling it. Thank you very much. Good job, you guys. <laughs>